begin by just making some general comments about old roads and new roads, um, which, um, so, the, so while the old roads, like the so-called Silk Road, and the new roads, like those being rebranded as the Belt and Road Initiative, may, may share overlapping routes that are determined by topographical imperatives of geography, the, the networks of paths taken by ancient travelers were qualitatively different from modern highways like the Karakoram Highway, which Professor Palmer uh, referred to in linking my talk with my friend, uh, Professor Hassan Karar's uh, previous lecture for this series in October. One of the differences between new and old roads was aptly noted by Mark Bloch, uh, an historian of um, the feudal age in medieval Europe, who remarked that traffic was not canalized in a few great arteries. It spread capriciously through a multitude of little blood vessels or capillaries. Whereas modern roads uh, create a vacuum around them to their own profit. I think his remarks about medieval roads in Europe are apt for both today's context and for the context uh, of uh, early routes uh, or a set of early capillary routes uh, that connected arteries of the silk routes with the old roads between South Asia and Central Asia. In this talk, uh, I'll show how religiously mobile Buddhist missionaries from India, Kashmir, and Gandhara, and Chinese visitors traveling to Buddhist shrines in India, and uh, what a French art historian, Alfred Fouché, called the second holy land of the Northwestern Indian subcontinent, uh, chose to follow their own itineraries uh, through the North Country, or the Northern Path. Um, I'll be discussing this term Uttarapata um, in the first part of my talk. This arterial network of routes with nodes at Matura and Taxila was connected to the Oxus or Amudarya Valley in Western Central Asia via an extension uh, called the Old Route, or in French, La Vieille Route, from Bactria in what's now Northern Afghanistan uh, to Taxila in modern Pakistan. Um, this term, the old road, was coined uh, by uh, Fouché, who founded the French archaeological mission in Afghanistan in 1922. However, graffiti inscriptions and drawings on rocks along the upper Indus River, so that's the area shown here on the map, that'll be the middle part of my talk, uh, and its tributaries in northern Pakistan, show that Fouché's old road was not the only pathway taken by merchants, missionaries, pilgrims, and other travelers, since there was a shortcut between Gandhara and the Silk Roads directly across the Western Himalaya, Karakoram, Hindu Kush, and Pamir Mountains to the Southern Tarim Basin in what's now Xinjiang. I aim to showcase how advances in digital mapping and imaging techniques are being developed to document and promote the cultural heritage of especially significant clusters of sites on the upper Indus River, which are threatened by an infrastructure projects, uh, particularly uh, the Basha Dam. So this shaded zone uh, shown here on the map would be the basin uh, or, the, or, or the lake uh, created uh, by this dam, which is uh, currently under construction. Finally, I'll argue that the evidence from these everyday sorts of images and writing on rocks supports a model of long distance transmission rather than gradual diffusion of religions and cultures. So I'll begin uh, by talking about the Uttarapata or the Northern route. Um, it was the primary artery connecting the Northwestern frontiers of modern day Pakistan and Afghanistan uh, with India. 
The Sanskrit term uh, Uttarapata, which is translated at the bottom of the slide, denoting uh, lands in the north stretching from uh, the Ganga and, and Yamuna uh, plains uh, to ancient Bactria and Central Asia, overlaps with its more specific etymological and, in my opinion, probably original meaning as a trade route. This network of shifting itineraries was not a single highway like the Grand Trunk Road uh, from Peshawar to Calcutta uh, constructed during the heyday of the British Empire in India uh, following earlier precedents uh, built by Sher Shah Suri. Uh, instead, the Northern Route uh, was a broad collection of flexible arteries on a loosely defined Northwest to Southeast axis intertwined with multiple feeder routes. Widespread distribution of distinct types of ceramic ware called Northern Black Polished uh, demonstrates continuities in material culture along the Northern route since the middle of the first millennium BCE. So around you know, 2,500 or so years ago. Epigraphic sources, that is to say inscriptions, indicate that road networks played significant roles in political administration, uh, military conquest, and contact. Rock edicts um, and pillar inscriptions of the Mauryan emperor Ashoka, uh, who ruled uh, in the third century from around 272 to 232 BC, set up an, set, were set up at important junctions of routes and in border regions. And they indicate that his domain encompassed most of the Indian subcontinent. Ashoka emphasized the importance of maintaining road networks and allotted the facilities available for travelers. So here you see the capital on the Ashokan, Ashokan pillar at Sarnath. And uh, then I've also included these slides from the, uh, of the Dharmarajika stupa, uh, at the site of Taxila near the modern day Pakistani capital at Islamabad. Um, so the idea was that uh, Ashoka's um, reign uh, extended from the borders with what's now Afghanistan on down uh, to Northeastern India along this kind of network of roads. So in the Ashokan inscription, in, inscriptions, the references to the establishment of provisions along roads, like for the planting of trees, um, to provide shade, um, and to have wells excavated, and uh, uh, watering places and rest houses built, uh, supports uh, the report of Megasthenes, a uh, Seleucid or Hellenistic envoy to the Marian court around 300 BCE about a royal road uh, leading to the capital city of uh, what he calls Palibotra, which is corresponding to Sanskrit Padaliputra, ma our modern Patna, and other roads uh, to mark distances and junctions with byways. From the third century, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, from the first to third centuries, uh, CE, sorry, the slide says AD, um, the Kushana lineage of rulers whose uh, ancestors called the Weija uh, had migrated from Eastern Central Asia, uh, they ga they'd gained control of cities on routes between Bactria and Northeastern India. A Bactrian inscription from Rabatak in Northern Afghanistan issued during the first reign of the uh, ruler Kanishka, whose headless uh, kind of colossal image is on display in the Matura, uh, Matura Gov Government Museum, um, proclaims that the Kushans had submitted all India to their will by controlling the major cities. In contrast to the material evidence of exchange and inscriptions, some normative textual traditions often express ambivalent perspectives towards the northern regions and peoples of the Uttarapata. Authors of uh, Dharma texts 
such as the Dharma Sutras and the Dharma Shastras. Uh, these are texts which kind of lay out the normative uh, rules or laws uh, for both uh, social, um, personal, and religious uh, um, uh, conduct. Uh, they regarded the areas to the west of where the Saraswati River disappears, which is in the Thar Desert of Rajasthan, as outside of the narrow, narrow boundaries of what they called Aryavarta, or the middle country, uh, Madhya Desha. From the viewpoint of Orthodox Brahmins, inhabitants of this region were stigmatized as impure uh, due to foreign contact with people like the Kushans. On the other hand, Buddhist narratives include many episodes of merchants from the North Country engaged in long distance trade, uh, such as the story of uh, two merchants named Trapusha and Balika, who became the first lay followers uh, by offering donations uh, to the Buddha just after he attained awakening. Literary and epigraphic sources show that the geographical position and cultural perception of Uttarapata fluctuated according to the perspective of the source. Uh, for example, uh, the um, early 12th century author uh, of the Raja Tarangani, which literally means like the ocean of the waves of, uh, the waves in the ocean of kings, um, which is a kind of, uh, which is a kind of historical chronicle of Kashmir, uh, describes an expedition by one of these kings, uh, King Shankaravarman, who died in 902 CE uh, to Uttarapata, but the reference is ambiguous, since the term could connote regions of the Kashas and Daradas to the northwest of Kashmir, or areas controlled by his Hindu Shahi rivals on the Indus River to the southwest of Kashmir. And of course, Kashmir, because it's in the relative northern country like Gandhara and the Punjab and other areas, uh, was generally considered uh, to be situated there along with Gandhara, uh, Taxila, um, and Mathura. Mathura was like the metropolis, uh, one of the metropolises which was served as a node on the Uttarapata just south of a modern New Delhi. Okay. Um, an extension of the Uttarapata um, or the northern route called the Vyal route, uh, the old road by Alfred Fouché, followed the uh, uh, Kabul River Valley uh, and crossed the Hindu Kush, Hindu Kush mountains uh, via several uh, mountain passes uh, to Bamiyan and, uh, and also to ancient Bactria. Excavations of archeological sites in Afghanistan and Pakistan have yielded important results which confirm many of uh, Fouché's statements about the intercultural exchanges between India, Iran, Central Asia, and the Hellenistic world. Relatively recent discoveries of Buddhist manuscript collections in the Gandhari language since the mid-1990s uh, demonstrate that a regional uh, literary culture flourished alongside distinctive visual and material cultures. Although most of these collections of manuscripts from periods between the first century BCE and the third century CE, uh, so these, these are, are actually not only our earliest Buddhist manuscripts, uh, these are our earliest uh, manuscripts from anywhere in South Asia. Um, however, they lack uh, secure provenance. We don't know uh, where exactly most of these manuscripts come from, although some Gandhari, and Sanskrit fragments depicted here on the slide, the Gandhari manuscript fragments, uh, uh, likely are from caves around Bamiyan in central Afghanistan. So along with these fragments of manuscripts from Gandhara, which tend to be written on birch bark scrolls, these uh, uh, poti format are these, uh, these kind of palm leaf fragments uh, from Bamiyan, um, there's also an anthology of previous birth stories in hybrid uh, Sanskrit from Merv in Turkmenistan, as well as a large collection of Buddhist Sanskrit manuscripts from a monastic library outside of Gilgit, which I'll touch upon later. 
um, and other Buddhist Sanskrit manuscripts from Khotan, Kucha, Torfan, and other sites around the Tarim Basin in Xinjiang reflect patterns of literary transmission between South Asia, Central Asia, and ultimately China. The model of a gradual diffusion of Buddhism in a sequential pattern along hypothetical old roads from the Northwestern Indian subcontinent uh, to the Oxus or Amudarya Valley in Western Central Asia and, the, and to the Tarim Basin in Eastern Central Asia and eventually to China is it overly simplified. Instead, Buddhist missionary, monks, nuns, and merchants utilized a much more extensive network of routes to travel beyond the borderlands of South Asia and also to come in the other direction uh, from China and even Korea uh, to visit the pilgrimage places, the Buddhist pilgrimage places in India and in the Northwest. Okay, so now I'll turn to this area of uh, epigraphic and petroglyphic complexes uh, where I'm currently leading a, a team of Canadian, Pakistani, um, American, and, 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 and European and Australian researchers. Um, this is kind of the second phase of a project that began in uh, 2017 um, to bring more attention uh, to around 50,000 petroglyphs or rock drawings and about 5,000 inscriptions that demarcate a network of interconnected passageways that directly connected uh, the northern route or the Uttarapata of South Asia with branches of the silk routes in Eastern Central Asia. So that's what's depicted on this slide is this uh, kind of intertwined network of uh, capillary routes across the Western Himalaya, um, Karakoram, and Hindu Kush mountains. So despite the obvious difficulty of crossing these mountains, the anthropologist uh, Carl Yetmar, who established a project when the Karakoram Highway opened with his Pakistani uh, counterpart, Ahmad Hassandani, um, to explore and uh, document uh, the sites of petroglyphs and inscriptions. This, this led to a long running project that was centered in the Heidelberg Academy of, so of Humanities and Sciences. Um, it published a series of several volumes um, with catalogs of many of these sites up until around 2011 or 2013. So I kind of got off track a little bit, but um, Yetmar uh, noted to quote him, a shortcut between Central Asia and South Asia was possible, uh, partly compensating for the dangers and strains, unquote. Routes through the mountain passes and river valleys of the upper Indus and its tributaries linked Buddhist centers in uh, Gandhara, uh, which was connected via the Swat Valley and, and the Indus River to this region, as well as uh, Kashmir, um, Ladakh, um, and also the Southern Turin Basin in Xinjiang. Unlike uh, modern traffic, which is restricted uh, to the Karakoram Highway uh, between Northern Pakistan and uh, China, ancient travelers could choose their itineraries based on environmental, economic, political, and religious considerations. The vast collection of written and visual records demonstrate significant uh, religious and cultural mobility in this high mountain region at the roof of the world, or in Persian, uh, the Bamedunya. A major site of uh, inscriptions and petroglyphs at Haldakish in the Hunza Valley uh, functioned as a significant way station on the network of capillary routes through the Karakor Mountains. Um, I'll click on this pano tour of Haldakish to give you a sense of the topography you know, I might need to stop my share and, and share something else. So let me try that. Okay. Um, and I will go there and I will go here. So basically this is a site where we, which is right alongside the Karakoram Highway, 
which you see here. And um, if I move things around a little bit, you can see the Hunza River here, as well as um, kind of the, 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 the extreme topography there. Um, this kind of uh, pano, these pano tours are courtesy of uh, Dr. Mortiza Taj of the Lahore University of Management Science, whose uh, heritage360.pk site hosts uh, pano tours from Hunza Haldakish and um, uh, other sites um, in the uh, province of Gilgit Baltistan. So I'll stop that share and I will share a different screen now. Um, so, in terms of the uh, material that is drawn on the rocks uh, are the so-called sacred rock of Hunza, what you'll see for the most part are uh, drawings of many of these uh, kind of mountain goats, or in Latin we could say capriti, which are sort of indistinguishable from um, the ibex, the the um, and so that's where Haldakish gets its no name as uh, its namesake is from Halden, uh, which is uh, Ibex and Boruchowski. But what's also interesting is that there are around 150 graffiti inscriptions in a range of writing systems uh, that reflect a multicultural crossroads uh, in a transit zone that connects the upper Indus region in the borderlands of South Asia with the Southern Tarim Basin in uh, Eastern Central Asia. Um, so these uh, Kuroshti inscriptions, uh, the Kuroshti was the script used for writing Gandhari, which um, faded out and uh, was replaced by the use of Brahmi, which was used for writing Sanskrit and hybrid Sanskrit. But we also find um, a couple of Iranian inscriptions in Sogdian and Bactrian. I mean, a couple of seven, that's not it's a little bit more than a couple. And also a Chinese inscription. Uh, this Chinese inscription uh, records the visit of a Wei envoy, like a Northern Wei envoy, uh, to the kingdom of Mimi, which is probably a toponym in Sogdia. Um, and what you'll notice about the Chinese inscription is it gets overlapped uh, by the drawing of either a stupa or a phallus and a Brahmi inscription that goes along with that, uh, giving the name of Harisena. So, um, I previously studied these inscriptions, which were first published by Ahmed Hassandani in 1985 and 1987, while conducting epigraphical field research uh, for my PhD dissertation in 2001. Uh, I was able to improve some readings of the Indian inscriptions uh, written in Gandhari and hybrid Sanskrit uh, based on a research visit in 2004 to the Heidelberg Academy of Humanities and Sciences where the research unit for rock drawings and inscriptions on the Karakoram Highway was maintained under the direction of the late Harold Hoffman uh, until about 10 years ago. In June and July 2019, I returned to Hunza with a research team uh, from the Lahore University of Management Sciences and uh, my own university uh, to apply digital imaging techniques. So in this presentation, I'll be doing a kind of virtual show and tell uh, to demonstrate how these techniques can be used to enhance uh, the study of graffiti and petroglyphs as valuable features of cultural heritage. So I've already shown you um, some of the uh, uh, pano tours, and that's a technique in which a fish eye lens is mounted on a tripod to take uh, a series of panoramic photos, which were then stitched together uh, with others taken from different locations around the site to create a kind of comprehensive overview. Um, so these resulting images are not necessarily detailed enough uh, to read inscriptions or study individual petroglyphs, but this first level of documentation effectively conveys the layout, uh, topography, and physical environment, which helps to situate the uh, epigraphic and petroglyphic complexes um, in a vivid context. So I've given you here a list of some of the other techniques we've been using uh, over the years, uh, such as uh, LIDAR uh, laser scanning using uh, a machine owned by LUMS in Lahore, uh, 
photogrammetry. Um, that's another technique in which you can create uh, 3D models uh, by moving the camera around a rock uh, to create uh, a, a kind of uh, uh, view of how the petroglyphs and inscriptions are laid out on the individual rocks or rock faces. Um, and then one which I won't talk about in today is uh, RTI or, or reflective transmittance imaging. And that's when the camera stays in one place, but the light source moves around uh, the inscription or petroglyph with, to kind of highlight the, the grooves um, and uh, abrasions um, into the desert patina uh, covering the rock surface. Okay, so um, another site that uh, was very important for my research uh, was a site near the confluence of the Indus and Gilgit River at a place called Alam Bridge. Um, so these rocks at Alam Bridge are covered uh, with the similar types of graffiti in the Kuroshti script for writing Gandhari and Brahmi script for writing Sanskrit. Um, and uh, reflect similar patterns of long distance travel and Buddhist transmission. Um, it's located at an important junction of routes connecting Gilgit with Baltistan via pathways through deep gorges of the Indus River uh, to Skardu and with Kashmir across the Deosai Plains or the plateau. Um, so at this site, uh, there are very few uh, petroglyphs of Buddhist uh, monuments or stupas um, or other images to indicate that the site functioned as a Buddhist shrine, but personal names and titles clearly indicate that many visitors had uh, Buddhist names and titles. Um, the um, Maybe what I'll do now, instead of going into those examples, is I'll uh, click on a hyperlink to the tour at Alam Bridge. Can you see this uh, website now? Yep, okay, all right. And um, so this is again, um, and the reason I wanted to do this is because actually it doesn't just include the site, the, the site with the inscriptions, but on top of a plateau, there are many rocks which uh, have an epigraphic uh, designs of petroglyphs all over. Um, and I think uh, just showing you this slide kind of gives you an idea of just the extremity of, of, of the terrain on top of this plateau overlooking the confluence of the uh, Gilgit and, uh, and, and, and Indus River. So this is, you can see the Indus River down here. Um, and uh, this is the area where kind of the uh, Western Himalaya, the Hindu Kush, and the Karakoram chains of mountains uh, converge in this suture zone. Okay. Um, so in addition to the uh, plateau, there are also uh, inscriptions below uh, where these, uh, where, where the Gilgit and Hunza, uh, where the Gilgit and Indus rivers uh, come together. So that's the actual confluence that you can see there. Um, and if it was a clear day, uh, as the uh, panorama, pano tour spins around, you would be able to look down the Indus River and see uh, the Nanga Parbat uh, mountain, which is hidden by the clouds. One of the, one of the 10 tallest mountains in the world, which marks, uh, which is part of the Himalayan chain. Okay, so um, let me move on uh, so that I can finish the talk uh, um, that I was assigned to do. Um, if we proceed downriver from uh, the confluence with the Gilgit River. Several petroglyph and graffiti complexes are located at crossing points with many impressive Buddhist drawings concentrated near the modern bridge but, uh, across the Indus River at Chalas. Um, donative inscriptions um, identify Buddhist uh, petroglyphs, uh, narrative scenes, and portraits of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas as religious offerings, uh, Deva Dharma or Deya Dharma in Sanskrit. Um, so 
one of the most impressive drawings is a large drawing of a stupa, right? A, 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 sh a shrine which marks the uh, uh, presence of the Buddha uh, through his relics. Um, and in this, you can not only see that there's someone kneeling um, on one side of the stupa that he's labeled as the, the teacher Mitra Gupta, and then the donor of the drawing, Kubera Vahana, is also kneeling on the other side. So it's clear from other inscriptions and drawings that Kubera Vahana was a major local patron of these exquisite rock drawings, which not only included stupas, uh, but also uh, narratives from the Buddha's life and his previous life. So this is a drawing of uh, the Vyagri Jataka. This is the story of the hungry tigress in which the Bodhisattva sacrifices his own life to save the tigress and her cubs, which you probably know uh, from Chinese Buddhist art. Okay, um, the drawings also included um, bodhisattvas uh, like Avalokiteshvara or Guan Yin um, and uh, Maitreya. Um, so you can see Maitreya is uh, not only labeled in the Brahmi inscription, uh, these are inscriptions that are gifts or donations of another local donor named Sinhota, uh, but also by his uh, icon iconographic features. A short distance downstream from the bridge is the site of Chalas II, um, with about 60 Gandhari graffiti inscriptions uh, belonging to periods from the first to third centuries, so relatively earlier uh, than the other Buddhist drawings. Um, and so uh, you might recognize this picture because it's the one that was chosen uh, to appear on the, on the poster for the public talk. Um, so petroglyphs of uh, Buddhist monks and dismounted horsemen venerating stupas, images of Krishna and Balarama and the goddess Hariti show that um, Buddhist, Hindu, and indigenous traditions uh, shed light on multiple religious proclivities of visitors to this encampment, uh, which was apparently not an exclusively Buddhist shrine. Um, so what we're doing now in this phase of the project is we're going to the various uh, sites which we've uh, kind of allotted into various zones along the part of the Indus River that will be flooded if the dam is uh, constructed. So at this stage, uh, last fall, uh, the team was working in zone five. So this included sites from Chalas II on up, up river to Gichinala. And they're about to go back to work at uh, uh, sites around the village of Tulpan across the Indus River, where about 800 rocks have inscriptions and petroglyphs. So we're expecting that work to take them through uh, until about May. Um, all right. If, how much time do I have left for the presentation? I think maybe uh, five to 10 more minutes. Okay. So instead of talking about one more um, example uh, of the site of Shatial Bridge, where we started our work in 2018, uh, I'm going to um, uh, give you a list of the uh, previous publications. So you have two series, Antiquities of Northern Pakistan, um, edited by Yetmar and his other collaborators, as well as a series uh, in German for materials for the archaeology of Northern Pakistan, which has the detailed site catalogs. So uh, the site of Shatial was published in 1997. And some of the other sites that are underlined here along the upper Indus River have also been published. But the uh, it, comprehensive documentation of, these, of all of these sites has not yet been completed. So what we aim to do is to fill in and build on these foundational publications uh, to create models, uh, digital models, of these sites on a rock by rock uh, basis. So 
in addition to uh, doing editions of the inscriptions, so Shatial was, uh, you know, very rich in Iranian inscriptions, uh, particularly the massive collection of Sogdian inscriptions. Um, this was like the longest Sogdian inscription, which uh, was translated by Nicholas Sims Williams, uh, which records, uh, uh, you could tell that this kind of shows that it was that they weren't just coming to Shatial to engage in trade, because the Sogdians were uh, kind of merchant, long distance merchants, controlled a triangular network. Uh, one point in this triangular network was this upper Indus region of northern Pakistan and Ladakh. Another point was Western Central Asia in their homeland of Sogdia. But of course, they also, as you probably heard in the uh, talk by Andrea Chen, um, extended uh, their network to Dunhuang um, and even to the, you know, China, even to the Chinese capitals at Xi'an and, and, and Luoyang too. So they were here. And um, so it raises interesting questions about what the function of the site was. Okay, so what we're doing is we're using these techniques of laser scanning uh, uh, to generate point clouds. Um, and uh, these point clouds will allow us to navigate through the sites. And then we're able to integrate the laser scan fly through videos generated from the point clouds with the um, photogrammetry models of the 3D rocks and integrate them uh, with the 2D images, uh, which we can um, segment out the individual letters. So basically what we have is uh, a, uh, an integration model where we upload the 3D uh, um, model uh, generated from photogrammetry uh, and link it uh, to the edition based on the 2D image. All right. Um, so I'll skip over uh, this nice, uh, well, actually what I'll do is I'll, to end my talk, I'll play this video of a drone flying over the site of Shatial, and I'll wrap my talk up with the discussion of uh, paradigms of religious mobility and long distance transmission, okay? So um, according to the standard model of diffusion, Buddhist missionaries gradually spread the Dharma beyond South Asia to Central Asia and eventually to China by moving from one center to another along major trade and travel routes. Uh, this process whereby economically parasitic monks and nuns moved out along major routes in order to establish residential monasteries near cities or prosperous agricultural areas where surplus resources were available for making do donations was termed uh, contact expansion uh, by Eric Zorker, a really uh, prominent uh, historian of Chinese Buddhism, whose book, uh, Buddhist Conquest of China was published in 1959. Of course, that book was contested by uh, Kenneth Chen, who, uh, wrote the Chinese transformation of Buddhism. But rather than talking about that debate of sinification versus conquest, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, a different kind of heuristic juxtaposition of models that Zorker endorsed near the end of his career in the 1990s because he recognized that contact expansion or diffusion uh, did not really help him to adequately explain the early stages of Buddhism in the Tarim Basin in China. Um, and that's because uh, Buddhist communities began to flourish in Luoyang, uh, Pangchang, and other Chinese centers uh, before stupas and monasteries were established in Eastern Central Asia, uh, or modern Xinjiang. Um, Zorker argued that before around 250, it remained a Buddhological vacuum. To account for this chronological discrepancy between early manifestations of Buddhism in China uh, during the first two centuries and the late appearance of Buddhist institutions in the Tarim Basin, Zorka proposed that Xinjiang remained a transit zone until material conditions provided uh, uh, the resources for residential monasteries to flourish after the third century. 
Zorker juxtaposed the model of diffusion by contact expansion uh, to an alternative theory of long distance transmission in order to clarify early patterns in the cross-cultural movement of Buddhism to China, uh, despite the absence of monastic institutions in intermediate transit zones. So I've proposed that the alternative paradigm of long distance transmission also applies to the transit zone of the upper Indus uh, in Northern Pakistan. And this is because modern assumptions of gradual diffusion along major highways like the Silk Road rebranded as a BRI with branches leading to Pakistan and India, uh, did not help to explain the irregularities, deviations, and innovations, which we find basically at places like Shatial, uh, Chelas, Alam Bridge, and Haldakish. So, um, as the drone kind of turns around and flies back towards the bridge, I'll just uh, end this talk by offering some considerations that may be relevant uh, for this online public lecture series on religion and empire. Uh, Cross-cultural contacts and interactions that take place in transit zones of the Tarim Basin in Xinjiang and the upper Indus region in Northern Pakistan seem to deviate from imperial paradigms. In these places lacking imperial institutions or control, the local evidence of graffiti, petroglyphs, and other written documents like, like the Gandhari documents from Nia uh, and other sites in the Southern Taran Basin uh, provide more interesting and reliable records of religious and everyday mobility than the relatively scant notices from the centers of empires. The writing and the images drawn on rocks at epigraphic and petroglyphic complexes by local inhabitants and pre-modern wayfarers who chose their own itineraries based on religious, commercial, political, and environmental conditions show us that there was no single way to go. So thank you for your patience. Uh, and I appreciated uh, being able to share uh, some of the uh, uh, preliminary results of our research with you tonight. So I'll stop sharing the screen right now. <laughs>